Welcome to Science Frontiers, a space for discussions in the frontier areas of science and technology. I am your host, Vinay Panda. In our second episode in the series on philosophy and science, we shall talk about two towering figures, Karl Popper and Thomas Kuhn. We shall discuss about what they wrote and how that shaped discussions in the way science is practiced, accepted, and falsified, even today. Both Popper an Australian philosopher, and Kuhn, an American historian of science, overlapped for a larger part of the second half of the last century. Although what they prophesied were at odds at times, one cannot deny their role and influence on how science has been practiced for the last century. Today, in this episode, we shall discuss about these two gentlemen and what they wrote about science and how that shaped our practice of science today. With today's question, the of Sundar is the founder of Barefoot Philosophers and is a visiting faculty at the Center for Science and Society, sorry, Society and Policy, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Sundar, welcome to the forum and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Bilal. To begin with, let us start with a simple question. Can you take our viewers back to the history and tell who was Karl Popper? And we'll talk about Thomas Kuhn a bit later. But let's start with Popper first and a bit about his personal journey. Um, okay, there is, of course, there's a lot um, in this. So let me try and connect it to the, the question you're going to come back to with Popper. And what was the essential drive of what Popper was trying to do? And in that sense, what uh, Kuhn was also trying to do. Um, and this is a question which is very simple. What constitutes science? It's, you know, everything that we need to understand about them begins by trying to see what are the best ways of asking the question, what is science really? And then you can expand it to ask what is the nature of scientific knowledge or what is the nature of scientific truth and so on. So I would say that one of the greatest um, contributions by both of them have been about bringing this question of finding a methodological attempt to describe the nature of science and the nature of scientific knowledge in a way which draws necessarily upon the disciplines like philosophy and history in the in their respective cases. Uh, one of the <clears throat> important um, personal associations with Popper with this question is, of course, uh, his uh, attempt to try and distinguish what constitutes constituted science from other disciplines. So very well known examples of how would you distinguish the physics, which is Einsteinian physics, for example, in the Popperian sense, to with uh, things like astrology or even psychology. So what is it that constitutes a difference between them as knowledge systems, whether we call them as science or not, is second. Then since these were seen as sciences like physics, chemistry, etc., then the attempt became a way to distinguish between the sciences, a set of disciplines called the sciences and others, which seem to be doing something similar. Which really bothered um, in the sense the point is therefore to understand first of all that many many types of activities have share some common properties. For example, they all seem to be producing knowledge, including astrology and psychology, for example. They all, all seem to have notions of verification that one could say something and you could verify a statement through empirical measurements, etc., or through experience. You could also have predictability, which was a particularly interesting case of comparison between astrology and science. And therefore, the questions are, uh, which, which we need to tackle with is, is there something different to the idea of science, which can distinguish it from these kinds of uh, things. And for Popper, uh, coming from a tradition of uh, lo logic, which is what his uh, philosophical training was, um, there, there were obviously attempts to relate the question of logic to science. And this is an important, um, you know, very important aspect. We should recognize this because it was also at a time in which people, uh, um, you know, recognized, and this is a question which is also being worked on by Hans Reichenbach, for example. Uh, this is a question which people were uh, looking at the way in which science is being used, which is quote unquote the, the you know, the creative nature of science versus a kind of a systemic logical structure to the production of scientific knowledge. And that was actually handled very well by Reichenbach when he demarcates this question, distinguishes this practice of science into 
context of discovery and context of justification uh, where science really comes into play but all of this are working with uh, you know trying uh, i mean we we need to take into account all of this to recognize when popper is moving towards giving us a criterion for understanding what constitutes scientific method and his uh, and and his coming to this point about um uh, falsification as a falsification is a very important step in this and the question of falsification uh, i mean you know, the coming to falsification of popper you know given the fact that he was a logician or had trained in logic is not very surprising because this is a problem which has been very much part of the law law the discussions in logic um, particularly with respect to the question of uh the pro what is being called the problem of induction or la la larger problem of inductivism and this problem is that you know uh, in uh, induction is a particular model of science so the first uh, critique of the logical structure of science if you like comes from the humean argument that scientific knowledge is inductive and therefore in since induction does not have the certainty of deduction therefore scientific knowledge is always uncertain in as in contrast to a deductive structure and of course we should remember that the model for deduction was mathematics and there were also at a time in western philosophy when philosophy was being uh, attempted to be modeled on deductivist systems so the the critique that induction does not give you certain knowledge because of its inherent ambiguity because of the inherent generalization present in it meant that any knowledge system based on induction is always fallible incomplete maybe you know untrue false etc in you know, all these questions which are related to the question of induction and logicians have of course been working very extensively on this question of what can guarantee what can constitute evidence for in induction so the famous example um which is also something which of course popper knows very well if uh, all crows are black all you need to do or similarly the swans you know the reverse thing is the swans all swans are white and what you need is one swan which is black to uh, negate that particular conclusion so the point about induction and how it connects to the larger context of scientific theory for popper is the fact that induction the premises of induction like this crow is black the second crow is black third crow is black therefore all crows are black as a conclusion the premises are observations um you know it could be measurements experiences observations and the conclusion is a generalization which is a standard example of a theory you know one of the most prototype example of a theory so induction seems to move from observations to theory and it was something of obviously this is something very close to the practice of science because in the in one model of science where you observe phenomena in nature and from which you deduce or you can't deduce i mean this is the problem the humean problem from which you can conclude uh, for to a particular theoretical description of that phenomena that seems to have been a very uh, central uh, core definition of science so uh, for popper this is a problem because there is a there is a uh, the, the i mean maybe there's a lesson also from the point of induction that suppose i say one crow is black two crows are black and conclude that all crows are black <coughs> and if i ask what is the evidence for this i can show 1 million crows which are black but still 1 million crows which are black are not uh, conclusive evidence for the statement all crows are black uh, again you know we have to see this historically popper is coming from a logical tradition logical positivist tradition too which is looking at uh, evaluation of truth and falsity in terms of uh, with respect to statements you know the statements are true or false and so on so uh, here there is a problem with the word all the problem is really about all all crows are uh, uh, black right so whereas uh, the strength of a negative instance which is to say if you find one crow which is uh, white uh, demolishes this is something which is uh, becomes when taken up by popper into a methodological stance or into what he calls as a critical attitude then that defines what the popperian larger project of understanding scientific knowledge is but we should remember here again that this is not unique to popper that this is a problem which comes from in Uh, you know analysis of induction and and i'm not going to talk about this but just for your viewers or those who are interested uh, they should look for example at the early formulations of the of induction in indian logical systems both with nyaya and buddhists 
and the dignaga's formulation the three uh, you know there are three conditions for knowing the validity of induction and this is very fascinating i'm just saying this to see so that you can see how falsification actually is a central core problem of a larger uh, aspect of cognition so uh, the dignaga's three conditions suppose for example i want to say smoke where i see smoke there is fire i may see smoke and fire 10 times and i may say wherever there is smoke there is fire right um uh, that conclusion how can i ground it how can i justify it in that sense and for dignaga it is justified by uh, a very empirical uh, sequence of uh, the, you know instances where you have such a case which is happening that there are cases like this smoke and fire are, uh, come together and there is a third condition which is a negative condition that there is no instance where um they occur um it's 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 a contra a contra positive condition that um for example uh, smoke cannot occur over a body of water where water is contrary to fire and it's a very interesting uh, uh, way to uh, you know approach the problem of the riddle of induction if you like and that is this question that's where the question of falsification is really in a sense coming from um it is also goes back i mean when popper expands it into a methodological thing of course it, it it picks up the notions of critical rationalism and so on but before that the point here is that um you know it it is not just this attempt to hold on to this falsification question but also the suspicion about verification uh, that comes from the response to other disciplines you know like astrology quality big data the verification seems to be able to support a theory and it's just like supporting a theory that all crows are black just by pointing out one instance here another instance third instance tenth instance and being satisfied with that and the problem in the context of doing science is that once you look for verification you will always find that verification statement you will always find you can verify a particular theory so it's actually a double attack on the notion of verification and the importance of falsification thank you thank you so much sundar for actually discussing this in detail and i think for our viewers it is important to reiterate what you said that the central theme in popper's ideology and most of the work on falsifiability is not new to popper or not the work mm -hmm. that popper only advanced in fact in our own philosophical thoughts the eastern philosophical thought the indian philosophical thoughts as you mentioned in nyaya and we also have this centrality on induction so this theme about induction and how falsifiability actually came into being although popper advanced it and was known on um, famously known for it but it was just him there were also other philosophers during the time who advanced this thought now if we move from the whole theory of falsifiability and in fact if i may just spend a minute to tell our viewers but particularly natural scientists this is an important thing to understand because for most of our life what practicing natural scientists do is to prove something right or what they believe is right in fact the whole theory of falsifiability or induction is as you have beautifully explained with the example of black crows and white swans that all you need is a simple example even if you have a million other cases to prove yourself wrong now moving from the theory of falsifiability and what karl popper did let us just move a bit about talking about thomas kuhn and how thomas kuhn's central idea about scientific revolution and work on dogmas shaped the way we understand about science so take our viewers back to what thomas kuhn did or who he was and what was his central theory about scientific revolution is all about okay so very quickly again here um thomas kuhn was a physicist and also a historian of science so you can see here already two different approaches to answering the question of what constitutes science what is the nature of scientific method what is the nature of scientific knowledge um and uh, so uh, kuhn's i think an important point which kuhn makes is this and the terms which are very closely associated with kuhn are the terms uh, paradigm um normal science uh, the question of uh, question of anomalies of course um you know within the within a structure uh, thing and and therefore as well illustrated by the title of his famous book uh, the structure of scientific revolutions um 
So at the, the Kuhnian argument, I mean, the Kuhnian model of science. So remember that both of them are doing models of science, understanding scientific knowledge. And uh, the Kuhnian uh, uh, model of uh, doing science uh, also reflects, I think, the changing time post Popper when he is writing about science and his own uh, involvement in the practice of science. And uh, being a practitioner of science, it's like an anthropological work. I mean, today, from you can look at it from a slightly different context and uh, draw upon this, uh, you know, the fact that you have an understanding of what it is that discipline has done when you reflect on that thing. I mean, I often think about this because in my own work in philosophy of science, a lot of it has been influenced by my early practice in science. So that gave me an insight into the daily functioning of what it is to do science. And whether how that translates into larger questions is a very different thing. But, uh, and I'm not even saying that should be necessary because it becomes a very contentious question in philosophy of science. Should philosophers of science do science or should they have died in science, science etc.? I'm not getting into that question. I'm saying in the case of uh, uh, Kuhn, um, so there is a particular grasp of the practice of science. And from that, uh, it seemed reasonable for him to say that science is progressing not all the time with a very skeptical, falsifiable attitude, trying to falsify statements, trying to see, you know, that critical attitude of Popper, which is the fact that you're not trying to find um, you know, uh, experiments or observations which will support a theory, but rather the critical attitude is to always to look at why, how can I prove a theory wrong, not how can I prove a theory right. Okay, and uh, uh, you know, I, at one level, when people have put this supposition between Kuhn and Popper, and that's been a big bit, which I don't think is really interesting to me in some sense, because both of them are trying to do something important and they're giving different models. Um, but and I think in the case of Kuhn, the question is about the in the character characterize normal science that there is a phase in which scientists are doing their work of science. And that work of science is not reduced at every moment, if you like, or even at every significant moment, to questions of refutation. And, you know, trying to refute a hypothesis, coming up with a new hypothesis, going back to the Popperian model of conjectures and refutations, right? And the point is to keep finding notions of refutation, not trying to find notions of support. So great experiments are not necessarily that which supports a particular theory, but which uh, shows something in the theory to be fault, so that the theory can be rectified or thrown out, etc. Now, obviously, for um, uh, Kuhn is also looking at a time when science has progressed rapidly, and being part of communities of science and recognizes that scientists are not doing that at all. In fact, I'm far more, uh, you know, I would extend the Kuhnian picture, and I'll end with that point just to show you why this kind of an uh, approach to understanding science is important. So in the question of normal science, scientists accept a particular paradigm, a particular kind of uh, established worldview, an established, uh, uh, you know, whatever picture of the world, if you like, and people are going to be working on it. And um, so when science is, so science progresses by a lot of normal science, you know, within the phase, the plateau of normal science, where there are no major contra refutations, contradictions, completely overthrow of theories. And those overthrows occur at, at paradigmatic levels. So it's like a quantum description, if you like. So there would be a phase of normal science, then there is a jump, a paradigmatic jump, and then that's another phase of normal science which, which will characterize that. And, and as I said, therefore, this is just more as a historical view, of course, as also the sociological understanding of how science is practiced. And um, so the, 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 the puzzle between these two become, uh, you know, th there's a larger fundamental problem, as I said, if the demarcation of science, and it's something very relevant to the Indian context, because very often when people talk about science, we often say science is logical, science is rational, be as scientific, you know, and we are, we are the only country in the world which has scientific temper as a constitutional duty. And if you ask what is scientific temper, we, all, we are all supposed to be, uh, you know, logical. But what exactly is the logical in science? You know, that's a that's a great story that we have built up in this, uh, you know, the so in the social context of science. But what exactly is the logical? That's a very important question. For Popper, um, it would be like a, a discovery of the logical in science through a particular methodological stance. And for um, Kuhn, the logical is present, obviously, in the doing of normal science. And there's also a great creative jumps when when you have paradigmatic jumps. Okay, and, and for him, 
uh, people have of course pointed out that uh, the question of anomalies and the way Kuhn, uh, you know, discusses the question of anomalies uh, in his own work uh, has some parallel with the questions of falsification, you know, because you're trying to make sense of things which don't fit and observations doesn't fit into the larger uh, expectations of the theory and so on. But uh, independent of that, I think this question about normal science and paradigms gives you one kind of a picture of science. And I think this is a, um, uh, you know, a kind of a true picture of science because, you know, if you extend this and ask a very difficult question today, uh, which is that what does the doing, what is the practice of everyday science amount to? What do scientists do? And that's important because a lot of students also, even those who have not become professional researchers like all of you, the question would be like if they're when they're studying science and they say, what will I be doing when I do research in science? What does it actually to do science, right? And um, the Popperian picture, I mean, as you very correctly said, scientists, the only idea of philosophy of science, which I see scientists accepting, at least in India, is falsification or falsifiability. They, and... Um, and I must say, many times it is uh, they have not really looked at the why the question of falsifiability comes um, and what is the problem with verifiability and the whole debate around it and why that needs a particular kind of a philosophical analysis. But to them, falsification captures something which they think is very important to science. Although there have been criticisms of falsification saying it is not able to do the job. Because remember, that one of the criticisms of verifiability is I can always save the theory. In a sense, suppose I say an observation and I want I see that it deviates slightly from a, a, something called a theory, I can always make modifications. The auxiliary hypothesis can be added in order to make sure that I don't have to jettison the whole theory. And that's part of the problem of the logical link between experiment and theory. In other words, what I'm saying is there's a very interesting philosophical foundation at the, at, at the bottom of all this, at the foundation of this, which is that I have phenomena, natural phenomena. I have experience of it, sensations of it, measurements of it. And then I have theory as language, theory as descriptions or explanations or whatever it does, right? And the, the, the fundamental question at the heart of all this is, how does language map to reality? What is the relationship between language and reality? That's all. Because there is something which is the real, which is not the linguistic, the, the bottle is not the word bottle, it's an object. And the word bottle is language. And the question always is, how does the language match with the question of reality? And that's very much a part of this whole debate, you know, in a, from another way to look at it, you know, in foundational sense, uh, this, this conflict between, not conflict, this uh, philosophical tension between physical objects and uh, descriptions of it, language and the world, okay? Uh, so, uh, what I'm trying to say is, when I look at science today, I would say Kuhn is largely right in the sense that there is a normal science. Um, everybody is doing science. So what do they all do when they do science? Uh, they'll be, for example, you're doing theory, there may be a particular model. And within the model, you're solving some equation or you change one parameter in the model, one assumption in the model and write another paper with it. Right? Um, the major paradigmatic chums also need not come essentially from refutations. One of the great examples is uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. Although the possibility of refutation would have come from Michelson Morley experiment, the null experiment for ether, um, um, Einstein is actually quite indifferent to that experiment. He doesn't refer to it in the initial part of his life, you know, and then later on people say, well, that could have been a kind of a, a you know, experimental observation which could have spurred relativity on, and then he makes some reference to it and so on. So um, paradigmatic jumps have happened completely with very different, not through falsification of particular things, but completely different ways of imagination and creative jumps, uh, structural jumps, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So I think this question, what, why we need to think of both Popper and Kuhn in this context uh, is for my, in the context of understanding modern science and the necessity for asking these questions today is the fact that today science has grown enormously, right? And it has become so big that um, by some account, I was reading that nearly 8,000 papers are published every day. And this is just the pub life, published papers. Forget about the amount which are written and submitted. And uh, millions of papers are being put into the PubMed and the archives. You know, you're, you're producing literally millions of papers. And there is absolutely no idea 
what is this scientific knowledge all about? Because remember, and I, I, I think this is a very, very crucial point. Uh, again, to come back to why proper and good are important to asking this question, because if, if every research paper in science is producing new knowledge, because that's a definition, unless you produce something new, they're not going to publish it. And remember that for every paper which is published, at least five or six have been submitted, if we I, I take an acceptance ratio of 20%. So, um, you know, if there are, if there are 8,000 papers published every day, it's about 40, 50,000 papers are being submitted every day, you know, as an, on an average. It's ridiculous to imagine that each paper is creating some delta K of knowledge. What is all this knowledge you're producing? And, you know, there was an uh, article, I think it was in Nature, which pointed out that all the science which has been produced till now, the quantity of scientific knowledge is produced till now, is going to double in the next nine years. That is, scientists are going to produce as much knowledge as it has been done over the last 200, 300 years, or 400 years. Right. And what is, the, what is the nature of scientific knowledge? We need to ask this question. I'm saying Kuna Papa becomes so important today. Yeah, I, I think they are also very outdated because the science has changed enormously, including questions of what is falsification, etc. But this question of what constitutes a speciality of science, what is the nature of scientific knowledge, the structure of scientific knowledge is very important because in this huge growth of knowledge, in fact, I would say, uh, I, 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 it'd be wrong to put a number to it, but I'm putting it, although I, I, it is comp uh, I'm sure it's wrong, I would say that majority of that work of production of new knowledge in these 8,000 papers published per day are the Kuhnian model. You know, are the normal science model where people are just playing, tinkering around with very small things. There are no paradigmatic jumps. The paradigmatic jumps are very few and far between. Refutation is not the driving goal of science. It's in fact just, in fact, it has become so specialized, people don't even know what they are doing, how it relates to something else which their own colleague is doing in the next room. Because that's the nature of the scientific knowledge, right? And how do we then analyze this question of scientific knowledge? What then becomes the new normal of doing science? And to extend, that is to extend the Kuhn's question. And to extend Popper's question, what happens to this question of conjecture, refutation, and critical attitude in science? And again, they are still working with a very, very traditional analytical account of science, both of them. But if you look at the kind of uh, uh, science which is being driven by computational methods, uh, digital technologies, and you know even students who don't know now how to solve differential and uh, integral equations because you can do it in MATLAB and other softwares, it's a very different idea of what are doing science really means and what the needs of scientific knowledge is. And therefore, given that, how do we really? Where is the question of conjecture and refutation? In fact, a Popperian direction, another very important part of Popperian thing, if Today, uh, nearly 40% of the global scientific money funds for scientific research, nearly that on an average, is coming for, is going to and coming from military and defense uh, budgets. They're all working towards that. And, uh, and the, another great number of work is being produced by the uh, private sector, the corporate sector, including in things like drugs and pharmacy and various other things. Therefore, to, to bring a Popperian idea of a critical attitude and conjecture and refutation in both these domains, which might constitute now maybe 70 or more percent of all scientific uh, knowledge, where in which privacy is, uh, their secrecy acts operate, uh, you know, what is the critical attitude which is driving that science, which is the majority of science? Uh, what does Popper actually mean? That? Yeah. Absolutely. So I think, Sundar, you have left, uh, you know, our viewers with two very important food for thought. First of all, you said those two models which are advanced by both Popper and Kuhn are relevant to an extent that most science which is practiced today are what we call as normal science in Kuhnian model. They are not paradigmatic shifts. At the same time, the Popperian model of refutation and falsifiability is not necessarily the one which is changing or bringing big change in our thoughts because there are very little creativity. So in that sense, the number of research papers that you mentioned are so large today, we perhaps, and this is perhaps what you are hinting, is we need to move forward, not necessarily saying those two models from Popper and Kuna are wrong, but perhaps this is time to think about a new model. 
which may yeah. include both the normal science model of cool, which is the majority of the science, because there are very few paradigmatic shifts, and also relying on partial falsification and refutation and the criticality that Popper was advancing. And I think it's also important to think, and you mentioned that uh, in the, the answer to the first question about you know what the Eastern philosophers through time have thought about the criticality and induction that you talk about. I'm afraid that's the time that we have for today, but we'll yeah. come back to this discussion sure. in future episodes. But before I yeah. end, I need to tell an interesting development on this topic, particularly which is related to today's discussion. You know, a physician scientist and a professor at Stanford University, John Ioannidis, has written extensively mm. about why most published science is wrong. In fact, in his 2005 blockbuster article published in PLOS Medicine, and he said, I quote here, why most published research findings are false, where he presented evidence that the majority of the claims in peer-reviewed papers today cannot be corroborated. He went on to publish another paper, co-authored with others in 2008, again in PLOS Medicine, with a title, Why Current Publication Practices May Disturb Science, where he actually goes on to say that the journals tend to publish spectacular results and not necessarily the results that are necessarily correct. And the reason I mention this is for the point that you mentioned earlier with 8,000 papers published every day and perhaps five or six times to that of 50,000 papers submitted every day, it's almost impossible to think about creativity as, and you also mentioned about when some part of the science which is sponsored and done in the private sectors, there is very little creativity we can think about, or rationality to, to put Popperian ideas in context. And also to our audience, particularly the science journalists and reporters, because many times we think if something is published, that's actually the gospel truth. And you know, that means basically we'll have to take that back and think more rationally and think about that what turns this creativity and what exactly the way science is going to be practiced in the future. With that, we thank you very much, Sundar, for your time. And we thank you, Vinay. We will get back to this important topic, sure. particularly to our science students. I hope that this provides a very important forum and understanding about a topic that, unfortunately, nowadays natural science students don't hear, don't talk, and don't discuss. Thank you very much. Yeah. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.